Thank you everyone for attending um, the practice talk number two today. Uh, the practice talk belongs to uh, the Mind Machine exhibitions outside as you can uh, see uh, uh, artworks and uh, today we, um, we have uh, three artists, uh, researchers, uh, working on the artworks and they will uh, give us some ideas and perspectives and uh, thoughts on uh, the artworks. I would like to introduce uh, Andrew Steve, Tofa and uh, Becky Lou and uh, Christian Berg. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm a little bit, bit worried. Uh, I'm a little bit, yeah. Uh, Andrew, uh, Andrew Steve and Becky Lou uh, has been working on the River City Network project and um, the, the result of uh, this exhibition, as you can see outside, is the, uh, the work name Sống Sa Ở Gần. Uh, later they will explain to you like, why they keep choosing the Vietnamese name, not English name for that. And um, he, next to me is Christian Berg with the artwork uh, named on, on the Places I Have Lived. And um, today, so yeah, I would like um, to uh, have Andrew and Becky first introduce about uh, your project, and then like Christian Berg will give you another like ideas um, about his works. Okay, um, so about a year ago, um, RMIT, my colleagues Becky, myself, and a few colleagues from RMIT, T put in a um, a bid to join a network, a global network of. Uh, River Cities um, is run by Leiden University in the Netherlands um, and it's got universities and, and research institutes across the globe all investigating the role of rivers. Um, perhaps slightly on an obscure note, we then decided to pick a canal rather than the river. Um, so we ended up picking the um, the, 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 the can, can te, ca, uh, canal um, which divides uh, District 4 from District 7, um, in part because um, it, it was something that was kind of imposed on Vietnam by a kind of colonial power. Um, and um, although it did have benefits, but it kind of divided a community. And I think that division, um, uh, the, it was the Can Hoi village, it kind of split it in half. And it was that kind of... Uh, issue kind of uh, piqued our interest. So the focus of what we're looking at is um, we're, we're kind of posing it as a sort of future heritage. So we're looking at, the, we're looking at how um, uh, the ordinary and unexceptional spaces of Saigon that are around this area, the bottom half of District 4, the top half of District 7, they're kind of, they're uncelebrated spaces. They're, they're seen as just being very ordinary. They're built by people. They're not planned. They're not designed. Um, they don't fit into a master plan. And um, so um, we found that those spaces are the spaces that are going to be lost. Those spaces are going to be lost when um, Saigon modernizes and, 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 and um, uh, basically the money men take over. So... Um, what we kind of identified as these spaces are a kind of uh, a bit like a future heritage. They, they will be the heritage of, of Ho Chi Minh City in 50, 100 years' time. They'll be seen as being the equivalent of the French villas are now and, and the, the mid-century modernist stuff, which is all getting kind of recognized and heritage. I'm already running behind, aren't I? Um, so, um, and the other aspect of this is that we, we were kind of, we set this project up, the RAR project up, with um, uh, the School of Business at RMIT, and particularly looking at tourism and kind of ethical tourism. So the idea that these spaces could increase, the, they could increase their cultural value in the eyes of government and, and, and the powers that be um, if, they became, if they became places which tourists actually understood but the problem is is when you bust tourists in you you kind of destroy the culture as well and you destroy the place um, so 
we kind of looking at this idea of, of kind of ethical tourism and, and trying to use that as a medium um, to encourage people to kind of understand that when they come here, it's about developing an understanding of a community and a way of life. It's not about coming, taking a picture, jumping on a bus and going off somewhere else. Um, so I explained a little bit that the, the, the project was split um, between um, uh, Can Hoi, uh, split Can Hoi in half. So now the top half is obviously District 4 and the bottom half is District 7. I'll let Becky talk about District 4. Is this working? Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Becky. Um, I'm the other half of so, uh, Son Gang. Um, so basically, when we started to think about this project, we wanted to tell this kind of story, but maybe not in the traditional way, through papers or through outputs like articles. So we decided to make something that was actually tangible, that was accessible to the community. So we're just going to talk about how we kind of first documented and kind of developed our work and the process. Um, as Andy already mentioned, the Kanta, sorry, I'm saying it wrong still, <laughs> was divided into two. So we have the D7 and D4 side. In our works, Andy and I are like focusing on two different areas. We actually have different practices as well. Andy has a more digital formatted process. Mine is a mixture of things. I'm a multidisciplinary designer. So I like to draw everything first. And actually, originally, when uh, you asked us about how do we see, perceive, fill, and capture space spaces, that's literally my process. <laughs> so what I chose to do was, because I'm focusing on D4, um, was I looked at that side of the canal and obviously the divide of the Kanhoi village. I documented everyday life by collecting data through capturing photographs, audio recordings, um, taking in all my observations and my experiences from exploring the area. This is going from walking around the different neighborhoods, the wards and the hems, really exploring those different shapes and types of spaces, and also those moments where you sit and pause, you drink coffee, you talk to some of the locals that live in that area, you engage just to see what's happening. So for me, pretty much everything was about being present in District 4 and using my data to then interpret into the AR sculptures. Um, aside from walking alongside the canal, I also explored the hems and the different wards. As you know, each district has its own identity and very much in those districts, every ward, every hem, every community has also got its own identity. Um, so my process really involved observing and drawing from this and listening and kind of interpreting in a sensorial way. I feel a lot like I'm quite hypersensitive to sound, to light, and I feel that when you're in these areas, it's something that's kind of invisible, this kind of tan intangible presence sometimes, where you can really see the layers of communication and the atmospheres around you. For example, when you're in a hem, and one near um, where I go a lot, um, is really long and thin. As I go through, if I close my eyes and just like block out that sense, I hear all the sounds of conversations. I can hear like the fish kind of like trying to escape from the baskets. I can hear these moments of the stopping and starting of the different semi, the motorbikes. So all these things to me are like layers of an area. They're overlapping, they kind of go apart, they do their own thing, they interact again, and they have this conversation where they dance around each other. This is how you get that essence of that community. And that's what I was trying to describe through my work. I explore this haptically, so I interpret it into textures and form. So very much a lot of my work through mark making is detailed, dot work, to try again to capture those layers. Um, and that's, uh, yeah, to contrast with Andy's digital forms, it worked quite well. In D4 as well, there's so much invisible energy that shifts and transforms. So this very much went into the process of making for me. If you've had a chance to explore the AR like installations, mine are these layers of artworks, like kind of these almost translucent like um, images that kind of overlap and then take form in their own way. Um, probably over time as well. <laughs> so really it's about, for me, that communication and capturing that between people to show that lived presence and existence of an area and what's happened over time. Sorry, over to you, Andy. Yeah, so um, my practice is more um, video, digital video based. And um, so 
when walking, I'd, I'd, I'd done my PhD on District 4, so when this project kicked off, I wanted to look at somewhere else other than District 4. So it was quite handy that Becky was happy to look at that aspect. So I wanted to look at District 7 because most of District 7, to be honest, is a bit of a car crash. And um, it's only the top half, the bit that used to be the Canhoi village before they built the canal, uh, or part of the Canhoi village, that still has this essence of, of um, the original space. So I spent a lot of time just walking around, videoing and, and filming, and uh, photographing, and just sort of drinking coffee and doing the things that all you do as you walk around, as you walk around the city. And it, it struck me that in a way that what's quite interesting, what I tried to capture in with it, within the ARs that, that I've generated is how the spaces begin to, begin to start talking back to you. So when researchers look at cities, they tend to focus on the community, they tend to focus on people and what people do. I wanted to kind of approach this in a slightly different way and begin to document what, what the buildings are saying, what the built environment is telling us and also what the natural environment is telling us. Um, so I was looking a lot at sensory research of someone like Sarah Pink, you know, who did a lot of kind of um, walking and, and, and um, trying to describe atmospheres and atmospheric presences. And um, so I tried to sort of develop the ARs along those lines. Um, Mine are the ones that are kind of a bit weird and abstract. They don't really look like anything. But they're actually all generated from aspects of um, my walks around. I mean, one, there's a big long red one which is made up of um, Lay's crisp packets that were kind of all um, laid out in a, in a shop. And I was kind of really interested in the the shopkeeper was so keen to arrange everything and she arranged everything really specifically with the idea that the, that the products for sale dominated. So her routes in and out and her opportunity to look back out are just through these tiny cracks between, between uh, packets of crisps and various other things that kids love. But um, so those kind of things start talking to me about they start telling me about the culture of the people, but not directly from the people, through the physical and, and, the, and the natural, the natural and the, and the built environments. Um, and that was a, a key thing for me. Um, I think I'm the next bit, and then you'll finish up, don't you? Um, so the idea of what we've done, so we, 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 our, our exhibit is in two locations. It's based here. Um, where we, we built uh, or we printed a metaphorical canal. We took a, a, a still frame from a piece of video and, and just blew it up and uh, made, made the long canal. And we put some QR codes on it, which you can all find in your, your, your flyers, um, which then trigger the ARs. Um, and, um, but the other half of this project is, is finding two cafes so there's a, there's a coffee boat in District 7, which is quite good fun. Um, and they, they've agreed to participate. So you can go there, you can pick up a leaflet and do the QR codes. And the idea is to look at the QR codes over a canal, which I'll explain in a minute. And then the other cafe is this sweet old lady in, on the District 4 side who has this really nondescript cafe, but she's just a very lovely lady. She's very welcoming and very helpful. And so we, we thought we'd include her as well, so we try and get some custom for them. Um, the idea is, is that you look at these ARs over the canal, and the idea, the reason, the reason behind that is the waterways in Saigon are the only spaces, or in Ho Chi Minh City, are the only spaces that you actually have space to view. It's, only, it's the only space in the city where you get any kind of sense of distance, a distant view. Um, the rest of the city is about sort of three feet away from your eyes. So everything is very dense and very compacted. The rivers and the canals are the only spaces that are open. So we wanted to use the ARs over the canal, A, because 
The ARs are kind of based on a response to the canal, so it's kind of a conversation back into the canal, as a, a metaphorical conversation. Um, but also it would allow the ARs to then have that sense of scale that, that um, we put into them. I'll hand it to Becky. Hello. <laughs> so um, a lot of you have been asking why AR? Why did we choose that? Okay. So actually both of us are from backgrounds as well where we've kind of uh, worked in digital media arts and immersive design and interaction design or design for interaction. So the reason why we chose AR is because we wanted it to be an accessible technology to the public audience, especially in the context of Vietnam. Most people do have a phone. It's easy to, fairly easy to use and then to also have that physical presence in the form of the AR sculpture. Um, you know, again, as I mentioned before, that we didn't want it to be at those uh, traditional formats of delivering research or our data that we've collected. And so that's why we created the AR sculptures. Um, in this way as well, it's kind of easier for people to relate to research in a kind of more like, um, well, in a public audience level. Sometimes these things can be heavy. So even if, like, um, when you play around the ARs, at first it doesn't make sense to you, by having it there and being able to explore it and doing it in your own kind of space whilst looking over the canal but in your own time also helps a lot with forms of interaction because then you can engage and you can also explore at the same time. If we chose a more overpowering uh, technology form like projection mapping or you know, generative, AI, uh, well, generative coding art, maybe it's too hard to interpret. So see this as just a starting point for us in terms of making something more accessible when it's research driven. Um, we also wanted to create an image with meaning. So currently um, in the context of Vietnam and what's happening in the emerging art and design scene, there's a lot of cool things happening everywhere in the city at the moment. Either it's like, I don't know, Colmook hosting loads of like uh, live events, De La Soul, Lab Saigon, um, you know, the Beatbox duo, oh, Wawa wow, Create, Tao Create. So like they're all doing these exciting things. And we also, you know, want to join in with this kind of emerging creative presence in Saigon, in Vietnam that's happening. But again, we would like to use our research and intertwine that so there is a deeper depth and meaning to what we produce. Um, so that there is more of that kind of narrative. Uh, so, I, oh, I guess this is me again. <laughs> So I said already this is the starting point. So what's the future? Well, at the moment, uh, this is our physical exhibition. And Andy has mentioned that we collaborated with two coffee shops, one in District 7 and one in District 4. They both face the canal. And the whole idea is, you know, jiao bang, like go there, meet the owners, grab a coffee, play with the ARs, and then capture that image. For them, it means a lot that you're coming to their kind of coffee shop. For Goldwyn in District 4, she lives there. That's her home. Her coffee shop has been a part of her house, I think, is it six or 16 years. Yeah. So, and, you know, even when we were talking to her about this, and she's just like, no, I don't understand the project. Even in that lovely communication and last night putting up the posters, she gets it in a way. And she was like, oh, I'm happy that something's happening. You know, that my identity, my presence being acknowledged, and that's what we want. So it's a small stepping stone. Also, we involved five alumni artists of ours. This is also to practice what we preach, I guess. We teach research in like a Capstone One studio at RMIT Uni. So we've used the same tools so that they can implement them in a real life project post uni. This is important for them as well to get their work out there because they're creatively brilliant. And also if you've played around, you can see that each person had a different interpretation of the project brief. And that's exactly what we're trying to capture. Different points of view and perspectives. Not everyone is gonna respond in the same way, and that's okay. And so we hope that between our AR sculptures, you can see those commonalities. Some people um, regarded District 7, some 4. There'll be comparisons, like overlaps, commonalities, as well as differences between them. And you know, even in terms of, I haven't got one, but you've all got the AR zine. This is also collaborating with Lomson Project to make the zine. So very much for us, this is the first point or first part of our journey where we will continue to evolve and reflect on what we've done and collaborate with local artists and emerging practitioners. We believe that as 
artists, practitioners, multidisciplinary designers, photographers, whatever you want to call us, um, it's important to note that in order to be a good practitioner, in my point of view, and I think Andy's and Christian's, you have to really learn by doing. You know, like, have your research, create your output, process it, reflect on it, and evolve. By no means should this be the end of any of these projects. We want to see what happens, and we'll keep kind of moving the journey along. Okay, I think I'm done, sorry. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Andrew and Becky. So now like, we can uh, go to the Christian birth practice. And uh, please save the qu your question for Andrew and Becky later because uh, there's a lot of things that are happening on District 4 and District 7. And of course, they, I know that uh, you guys want to ask, and uh, I think that there are uh, some of you are MIT students who like commute every day from like district one to district seven and then like you go through the whole area. Okay, so um, this is your slide, right? Okay, okay. all right. Uh, well, thank you very much. Um, also, uh, thank you, Becky and Andy, for uh, the nice introduction of your project. I think um, I can see a few things where our work actually overlaps, and I, I like that's some of the parts I want to pick up on, and I took a few notes about that. But um, first, I'd like to introduce my project, which is called All the Places I Have Lived. And this is actually a part of my ongoing um, practice-based PhD research. So um, this is the first output of that, actually. And um, I'd just like to uh, start with uh, discussing, um, oh, oh. sorry, <laughs> it's okay, I think let's do it like that. Uh, I, I'd like to talk a little bit about the origins of this project. So I said it's a part um, of my PhD research, but it's also a very personal project because what I'm doing in this project as that PhD took me um, on my journey is I, I started to shift the focus. I started trying to do a project about Saigon as the city, but I realized that the city is very much interwoven with my own uh, biography. So I'm using, a, in, in research, we call this methodology autoethnography, which means I'm using my own biography to try to find out things that might have um, a bigger meaning that can be applied to things. So I've been reflecting about my life here in Saigon, and um, I like to point out this quote I put there by uh, Willem Flusser, and what he says, I'm now without Heimat because too many Heimats reside within me. So Heimat is a German word for home, but it means much more than home. It has a lot of different connotations. Um, one of them can be quite kitschy, right? Like, a, like an almost nostalgic uh, viewing of your home. And um, I moved to Saigon in 2007, so I'm living here for 15 years now. But I even came here before, so the first time I came to Vietnam was in 2002. And um, as things go, like I studied, I got a first job, and I stayed. And I never expected that. And um, I think this quote um, relates to something that if you move overseas, and I think quite a few people in the audience can relate to that, um, something that nobody really prepares you for. And that's the idea that at one point your identity where you belong becomes split up, right? There are parts of you belonging here and parts of you belonging there. And that's that idea of I now have so many Heimats um, that, it's, um, that I'm without it, basically. And um, to step a little bit further, um, another uh, theorist, Homi Baba, talked about this as what he calls a third space, like a space between here and there where you find yourself if you have many homes, right? And um, to me, I realized that this third space for me means I belong to Saigon. So I think after so many years here, I could kind of see myself as Saigonese, but I will never be Vietnamese, no matter whether I speak the language quite OK. I have like a Vietnamese family here, many friends, but I would not consider myself Vietnamese, but Saigonese, belonging to the city of Saigon. And so with my work, what I wanted to do is start to understand how to capture a city. Okay how to um, basically um, take photos of a city. My background is that of a documentary photographer and a street photographer. I also did a lot of commercial work, but like really my identity of a photographer lies there. And 
after doing street photography for many years, I, I realized that the results often leave me unsatisfied because I feel you cannot capture what, a, what really what a place is within just one frame or even in a series of frames. So in 2019, just before COVID hit, I started to experiment with photography techniques that go beyond just capturing an image in one frame. So I started to work with a small pocket camera with lots of multiple exposures to look at the layers of the city. And I know both Annie and Becky also talked about the layers of the city. So I think that's one of the points where our work relates. And um, I started to work with that and um, realized that's maybe a more interesting way to look at the place, like have these layers being condensed um, in a frame. And that took me uh, to the idea of um, the work that I'm doing now. So that was just like one step on the work. But um, basically, yeah, what I realized is that the traditional camera-based photography has its limitations if you try to, to capture a place and also especially if you then want to capture what it means to you or to a person, right? Like that emotional connection to that space. And that led me uh, to my project, which I can, in the way I uh, worked on it, divide into two different phases. So um, I later at the end, I have a little flow chart where I can explain all the steps of my work. So right now I just want to explain what the two phases are. And um, the first one is image generation using generative AI. Okay, so I'm, I'm pretty sure everyone here in the audience is familiar with Midjourney or Dali or things like that. Um, these hit the stage when I was already working on this, so it was kind of funny to suddenly find yourself in, in this wave of AI, which uh, increased the pressure a little bit, but also is an exciting time to work um, with these kind of tools. And um, so what I thought is, sure, that's really interesting what Midjourney can do, that's quite impressive, but it's also ultimately a little bit boring because A, it, it only draws from other people's work, and also a lot of the images look very, very similar. So even when I started before Midjourney uh, and so on, started with this uh, work, I decided I want to use my own images as the starting point, right? And with AI, as with anything, is that the output, what comes out, really depends on what you put in. Um, so what I did is I used a tool called Stable Diffusion, which is a um, generative AI that you can run on your own computer and um, I used a plugin from Google called Dreambooth with which I could train this um, AI on my own photographs. So what I started to do to capture like the Saigon of my biography is I decided to go uh, back to all the different neighborhoods I ever lived in Saigon. And I realized that's quite a few after 15 years. So I identified 15 different, no, not 15, nine different neighborhoods, 15 years, nine neighborhoods. and. Um, so I went to all of these neighborhoods and collected a visual data set of photographs of this neighborhood, around 200 photos each. And then um, I did train the AI on these and then created images that are, in a way, a mean, like an essence of these 200 images. Hito Styrel, like a very famous German artist, she speaks of this as mean images. Okay mean in, in many different ways, but also the way that it's an average image. And that's what AI often is. It is an average of all the data that you put in. So in this first phase then, I created these images that could be as described as places not that have been, but that could have been, right? So here are a few more examples of that. I really like this one. That's not in the exhibition, but um, in, uh, in this form, I really like it. And if you're familiar with Saigon, maybe you can recognize some of the places these are based on. Anyone has an idea what this could be? Yeah? This is like City Garden, exactly. Or based on City Garden. So it's not really City Garden, but it could have been. But it's like an enlarged version of that. And so while I started doing this, I looked at that idea of the place that could have been. And I got more and more fascinated with the idea of how memory can play a trick on us. We think back of our own past and we get nostalgic about things and suddenly something is bigger than it was or smaller than it was or it seems more nice, maybe things in the past were easier and better even if they weren't, but we look like through these tainted glasses. And so I started to experiment with glitch-like aesthetics. So here I just used Photoshop to create another layer where I put like some lines in that looked like a glitch, right? 
But very soon I realized that actually um, using glitch-like aesthetics like that is pretty meaningless. It's just another layer on Photoshop. It's a filter. It's an effect. So um, I decided what if I can really create my own glitch. In the end, you will see I don't fully create an actual glitch, but still a glitch aesthetic, but it's much more tailored. So um, I took a dive into what glitch um, art actually is and what glitch aesthetics are. And um, I, like, I have a really nice quote there by one of the leading glitch artists called Rosa Mankman from the Netherlands. And she says, the glitch actually captures the machine revealing itself. That means glitch art often destroys something to see what is underneath. Destroy it by having a bad or like a line of code that doesn't do what it should do or destroying by maybe like um, working, like manipulating parts of a physical TV or things like that. And I'm not good at coding, but I like to be. So luckily ChatGPT happened to be there and I started to do what I would like to call a collaboration with a machine. And so in dialogue with ChatGPT, I started to write a, a software in Python, which I call Memory Infuser. And um, what this software does is it can create a glitch-like looking aesthetic. First, I created glitches, but that actually destroyed the image code. But the result actually, even though there were real glitches, were ra rather boring. So now I'm at this in-between stage where in Python, I use a, a plugin, um, like a library, which creates a glitch-like aesthetic. But the beautiful thing there is that I came to a point where I can give a prompt, which is a text, and this text is a memory of mine, of the place I've lived, and then the software creates a glitch specifically for that sentence. If I change the sentence, the glitch looks different. If I keep the sentence every single time I run the software, it looks the same. And I can you show you in a moment how that looks if the software runs. So this is just a process in collaborating with a machine, with ChatGPT, like going back and forth through, I don't know, maybe 50 iterations of that program and, until I had the... Uh, memory infuser looking like I want it to be, and this is the infuser. Let me see how I can start the video from here. I don't know where the mouse is. Um, no. No? Oh, no. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Gotta try to, to get the video running. Uh, maybe go back. No. No, that's not. Oh, I don't know. Sorry. Okay, in the slide, yeah, uh, right. But there should be a video playing. Ah, okay, that's great. That's better. Uh, let's go forward. I think I can find it. Sorry for that. Too fast. <laughs> Oh yeah, okay, so here we see that at play. So you, you take a photo or an image and you can write a text. In this case, that's like a memory of that place. And then you can infuse the memory by hitting a button. So for example, I put a, a year there, like without the year, the result would look different. And then through many iteration, it outputs many different images with a specific glitch while overwriting the text into the image. And then, after a while, we will see the final result. So as I said, that's um, after 50 iterations writing that software or so. So it was kind of a fun journey, and ChatGPT was a great tool to achieve that. All right. So, so that's how that works. And here are some of the outputs <coughs> Sorry, of, um, <coughs> of that phase. OK. So um, different neighborhoods and the different, um, the result then were nine neighborhoods of Saigon uh, with nine memories, which is the, the artwork you can see in the exhibition. And this in a way represents my journey um, as a foreign migrant to Vietnam. So you could kind of follow a semi-autobiography by starting reading the text in the middle image and then go clockwise from the bottom left. Of course, it doesn't tell the full story, but it's these memories, right? And um, to me, the idea of the glitch then is that um, I want to infuse that glitch because it shows 
it emphasizes on that idea of the distortion of your memory and of the nostalgia. So it, it makes, it renders the image now more unrealistic. So in the, in the stage before it looked almost photorealistic, but now it renders it more unrealistic again. And while it doesn't reveal the true um, being of the machine, right? It, it reveals to me how memories are really not always what we think they are. Okay, so that's the output. And um, I just want to spend a moment to talk about my workflow because I think quite a few people might be interested in that. So I just broke it down into um, this flow chart. And basically, um, as I said, what I do is I start by collecting images to prepare visual data sets. So I start by walking each of the neighborhoods like for maybe two hours or something, uh, take a lot of photos and then prepare a data set by, by choosing the images that I will use. Um, because not every image is like um, uh, technically good, so it could be like super shaky, which, which could be interesting to use, but usually it just distorts the data a little bit, so it's not so interesting. Or um, sometimes I take the same image or a similar looking image a lot, so if I would put that five times into the data set, it would like really stir it towards that image. So I just prepare the data set a little bit. I train um, the AI, in this case, stable diffusion, on um, this data set, so stable diffusion is what we call a diffusion model. It starts with noise and then builds the image up from that. So what this training process actually does is it uh, puts a layer on the existing data set and you train your own prompt. So anyone who ever used um, mid-journey or whatever, you create a prompt that you specifically name, in this case, for the neighborhood um, that I'm uh, photographing. And then, of course, like there's a really big output. So um, if you run stable diffusion on your home computer, you can um, output as many images as you want. So usually I, I um, produce a few hundred. That's enough to get an idea. And then out of that, I pick the ones that I really, really like, that are intriguing to me, and uh, put them in the second phase. Um, first, I adjust them in Photoshop. So I do a little bit Photoshop magic on top of that, using things like um, sky replacement and using uh, another AI filter that creates like a fake depth of field. And um, then the images I finally chose, then I infuse the memory like of uh, that period in my biography. And finally, I need to upscale it and then print it. And that's the result what you see there. And uh, just a little side note for, for the prints over there, I used the um, bamboo paper. Uh, from Germany, and I think that's interesting because A, it's from Germany where I'm originally from, but it's also a bamboo paper which I think really relates to Vietnam and to me that kind of physically rounds up the story. And that's it. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Um, okay, so uh, thank you. Thank, <laughs> thank you like, for three of you uh, present, presenting your works, but um, Okay, I have the question for the both of you, uh, for three of you, sorry. Uh, so like three of you, like uh, I can realize that like, the first topic you focus on Saigon, like Ho Chi Minh City only, and um, maybe because like, you uh, have been living here for a long time, and, um, but uh, three of you are using mem memories as an extension of the past. It means that like, you don't describe exactly the past, as the um, historical archive, archiving records, but uh, you, uh, for example, like Becky and um, uh, Becky and Andrew, like you are using it as a re revitalization of the like the disruption to to describe the disruption of the ecosystem near uh, on the river, and also like uh, Kristen, I think that like you are using the image as um, an in instrument to escape the realm of. Um, the memento, like using photo, like merely photography as a memento for remembrance. So uh, first, like Becky and Andrew, like why I, uh, what do memories mean to you? Because like, this is, uh, I think that they are like memories of others. And um, also for Christian, like what, like it's your own memories. So like the, do, do these images, uh, making the new memory of the place that you have lived, or it is exactly what you want, like old memory with the exact the feeling that like, you feel about the places. Okay, so I think that um, Andrew and Becky can answer first. Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll <coughs> um, start that one. Yeah, so I think memory is a really interesting um, 
aspect on this in terms that um, I, when I was doing my PhD, I read a, a book by uh, a woman called Svetlana Boym, who talked about nostalgia. And she talked about how people always, when they go somewhere, they always take something with them from where they came from. And that thing becomes a, a kind of um, a reference point. So it's always a little bit of where they've come from. So I think that's kind of a, a really critically important thing. And, and I think uh, what Christian was saying was kind of really interesting because in a, in a sense, I, I kind of um, fell in love with, with Ho Chi Minh City because it triggered, it triggered memories that I had from when I was really young. And I, and I don't know where it was. It, well, it, I know it was in London, but I was being taken by my dad somewhere. And it was just lots of small alleyways, very tight alleyways. So it's either the city of London or, or, or Soho kind of area. And, um, um, and so when I kind of came here for the first time and then kind of just by accident discovered this world of, of the hem, um, I, it, it triggered lots of memories and, and it's become, it's, it's been a fascination ever since. So I think that notion of memory is, 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 is critical for me because as I, I think Christian put it really well, you could maybe become Saigonese, but you never become Vietnamese, and which is a nice. I quite like that. I like that being in that middle space. But and um, just to follow on from what Andy has said, you know, talking about that middle space, I'm very much someone that experiences the in between every day. I'm in between cultures. I'm in between practices, disciplines, and you know, for me, like I'm British, Vietnamese, and Chinese. So I live in this space of memory and kind of nostalgia in a way too. Um, growing up in England and bo being born in England, for me, it's a general, generational heritage that I carry. And unfortunately, my Bawai and Omwai aren't around anymore. But being here now, I carry those memories through and almost connect the dots. <laughs> in terms of like my experiences now, I live in a hem, so I'm very surrounded by community. And even through just my observations, I'm starting to understand more about them. I think you said it before, and so did Christian as well, that we can't be accurate in that representation of the past, but there's no need to do that. You know, we're not a history book. So the way that we've gone about it is interpreting and giving it a new contemporary meaning maybe, or an interwoven narrative that hopefully speaks to like the generation now and what's going on. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah just to pick up on, um, I, I, I think that's like definitely reflects a lot of the things I, I similar feel about Saigon. Um, to answer your question about um, whether I'm using uh, AI to escape the memory or the, the idea of the photog photograph as a memento, um, I wouldn't say escape, but definitely it's, it's stepping away from that, right? Um, but it's also elevating or expanding it in a way, right? Because, um, of course, photography from its very beginning has always been this memento mori. Susan Sontag talked about that a lot in um, her on photography, right? And so it means like photography always reminds us of our mortality, right? Like that's that's one of the key aspects of photography. The moment we capture um, a moment, it's already gone, it's already passed, right? And so and that that that's what fascinated me in photography from the very beginning. How photography freezes time, right? And I think and now using the AI. What we see is not like frozen time anymore, but it is really what uh, Styro called that mean image. But I think that doesn't mean it's not a memento anymore. It just, in a way, maybe is even more revealing what this photograph or memory actually is because it is not, it is real, but it's not real. It's real in, in its physical presence, but what we see and what we associate with it is anyway a work of imagination, if that makes sense. Okay, so uh, I have like one more question for you. Like, uh, so during like you are dealing with the uh, AI bias uh, for Christian, huh? so uh, you uh, specifically use generative AI to create phones Im images, as you say in um, uh, in your quote, like, like could have been, and also you mentioned about the phoniness of the memories. So um, during the process of the creating these images. 
uh, could you notice that like the AI like spin out some like an an images that contain something else like maybe like problematic, maybe something that like you didn't expect that it will turn out. Um, th there were some interesting turnouts in in this specific uh, stable diffusion um, experiment, but um, before I trained my own AI, of course, um, I, I looked into AIs that are already pre-trained, and um, when I actually started this journey, like I assumed in a way that using AI and using my own images, whatever, would take away bias, so that the look of the machine is like cold and not discriminatory. But when I started looking much deeper into it, I realized that's actually not the case. AI is deeply biased, because the data sets on which AIs yes. are trained are deeply biased. Most of the AI, like Midjourney or ChatGPT, they're basically trained on the whole internet and some more. And of course, a lot of things on the internet are biased, right? So, I, like there are a lot of examples we can see online, but one of the things I did just to, like as a um, trial for myself, is I asked um, Midjourney to um, create images of Vietnamese people. And everything we saw were like really worn out faces, like wearing the hats from the north, and they, everyone looked like a, a fighter from um, like the, the war, right? And that very much resonates with the stereotype that people around the world still might have about Vietnam, right? And so um, that was another reason for me to train the AI on my own images. So that means there's still bias in there, but at least it's my own bias. And I find that interesting to actually see what that bias is. And while I didn't see anything crazily surprising in some uh, points, it, it showed me more as um, a result that I could see clearer patterns in what I'm photographing. So if I have a photography set, for example, I walked around Le Tanton and like this um, little Japanese town area now and there are a lot of like red lanterns and then the AI spits out a lot of them and interesting variations of that. Or I was in another area and I think that was close to, that wasn't Govap and like around to public holidays so there were a lot of Vietnamese flags out there. So then the AI created like interesting images with flags with many stars and whatever. Um, I didn't use that for, for my work because it didn't relate very much to my biography, but it's very interesting outputs, mm. right? So um, yeah, I think that's hopefully answering your question. Uh, just a very um, interesting experiment. And um, uh, why Becky and Andrew talking about like we, um, like we cannot like, how can I say, like, uh, review exactly that it's a past, it's an archive. So I'm thinking about, like, what you are saying about the disruption between, like, on the two sides of the of the canal, in your case. Uh, and actually, like, in Vietnam, we have a lot of rivers and we have a lot of canals. And um, we have the same thing, like, similar things happen everywhere. In Hanoi, we have, like, um, the Horn Old City in one side of the river, inside of, uh, um, yeah, in, in, uh, and on another side of the river, we have a like, new district, not like not really new, they are old, but like we often refer them as like new kingdom <laughs> because like um, people live there, like live, uh, they don't need to go to the to old city. And also in the in Hue, like, in the middle of Vietnam, um, there are like, two different parts, like old town, like old citadels, and then like the new part of Hue, and also like, they divided by the rivers. So, um, I think that like the disruptions, the disruptions that like you mentioned about on the two side river somehow is like very like natural phenomenon in Vietnam, um, to be to be exact. And then like the, uh, and then like so if the disruption like in my perspective is become natural. So what are you say? Uh, what are you? Um, how can I say? Trying to say when you mentioned about the living heritage, and um, yeah, what could be the loss? And uh, what could we, uh, I mean, what can we do like from now on to preserve it? Yeah, okay, so that, uh, yeah, that, I mean, that's an interesting part. I mean, uh, you know, canals, rivers always generate a, a kind of a natural barrier. But what we found out, um, we, one of our colleagues working on the River City Network is an archivist and he's been working with the archive in Saigon and there are letters uh, between the French and the Chinese communities based in Chaolon which describe about how the villagers of Can Hoi were not happy with the development of the canal. 
they were they feared that what is now District 4 would become an island, which is what it did. And through that, the French promised to build bridges, which is the bridges we, we kind of see now. Um, so it wasn't, no, it wasn't something that was a kind of a natural thing. It was something that was imposed, and there was a lot of skepticism about it at the time. <clears throat> but I think, I mean, for us, it's kind of interesting because there's that sense of, I, I mean, I don't want to speak for Becky, but I mean, you know, this, you, you know, when you, look at, when you look at that north part of District 7, it's so similar to District 4, and yet it's probably grown, you know, the, the two areas have grown up separately. It's gone from being village and marshland with some, maybe a few crops to, to really full-on, dense um, Ho Chi Minh City kind of, you know, uh, full full on um, uh, density. So, um, so that the, they've grown up in a similar kind of way. And I, I was kind of interested in the people that live there. How much they kind of feel that they are part of the other side of the canal, and 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 how that's reflected maybe in in the built environment. I mean, it's a bit. At the end of the day, it it it, it is it's it's down to personal experience, and and that certainly for my side of stuff, and I think probably for Becky as well, but you know, it's, it's the, the experience of being in those spaces is the thing you, you can, the only thing you can describe, um, because I wouldn't want to presume what people think or don't think. Um, even if I did extensive surveys, and there would still be a presumption of what's really going on in people's minds. Um, but yeah, I mean, you, I just want to add as well, I'm looking at this fly, it's chilling at the moment. Um, so actually in our research and um, when we're part of the River Cities Network and there are different pockets to it like river biographies as well, um, we actually saw one of the maps which was from 1800s or 1900s? Uh, this one from 1910. 1910. And so when you see this overlaid of on the map now, yeah. it's really interesting because obviously this man-made canal was put there to direct the trade so that it was easier um, for the port and for trading um, in that area. And in that in itself, it's almost imprinted. So when we looked at it, and I think you even like changed the opacity so that we could see both coming through. So again, like relating to memory, nostalgia, or a lived inheritance or a lived experience of a place, all these things are imprinted. And so that's also why this story in particular to us and this history was really important to capture. Okay, um, yeah, that's uh, enough for me. Um, <laughs> is there any question from uh, the audience? Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Becky. Um, so I have a question for Mr. Chris. So uh, what's your project? Like, how much does it mean to you? Like, uh, is it like for a celebration of like your haymats? Or is it like a preservation of your sacred places? Or like, what just what does it mean to you like as a person? Yeah. Um, as I said, th that, that's a good question. Thanks for, for asking that. Um, I think it's a, it's a little bit of all of that, right? Like it's, um, I think it's a um, almost, how to say, like a therapeutic um, way of like um, looking at um, like your own history, right? And I, I think that's one thing I really didn't expect when, when starting this PhD that it becomes a lot uh, very self-reflective on um, not only who I am as an artist, but who I am as a person and um, what does that mean? Because as I said, like, and I, I think both Annie and Becky can also see that, uh, this being between places, like having these many Heimats is, is something that often seems natural to us, but then sometimes it's also not. So, so I think for me, it's really just um, a way of, of reflecting. And um, that's the meaning in it. So it's not, not celebrating or um, cherishing certain memories, um, because through that memory infuser, it creates a distance. And actually, the image I see now 
is actually less nostalgic in a way than like the uh, version before where we can see a much more photorealistic image. So I think the final result is almost demystifying, if that makes sense. I did that in an earlier experiment. Um, I also had an exp experiment where I trained like a, a different type of AI, a generative ad adversarial network. On, on photographs I created of Saigon, but also in the same set with photographs of my hometown in Germany, Bonn. So I called that like jokingly Saibon. And the, the results were very eerie actually, because they were like, like it was a data set that had images of daytime and nighttime, so it looked like ruins with like um, kind of like little like uh, bonfires burning in it and whatever. It was like really really weird to to look at that combination of things, but um, yeah. So so I did that, and I also worked in in earlier experiments, just layering like um, more like postcard like photographs I took of Saigon. Um, but then for for the current work, I. I decided not to go in my, my archive because um, a lot of the work I did was less personal, so I think the result would be very different. Yeah, thank you for the question. <laughs> Filled with people in it, and I see that your photos that been generated is it looks unoccupied. So where in your process that you decided to only photographing spaces instead of the people activity? Uh, uh, there are there are different reasons for that. Um, like there's a practical reason. If you do PhD research and you take photos of people, you need to get not only their permission, but you need to go through a very lengthy process. That's a practical reason. But um, there's also um, a reason um, in my personal work, because um, if, if I look at my um, old work, like the work I did before this, um, by, by nature, in a way, I would say I'm a documentary and street photographer, so all my photographs always have people. As a photographer, I'm deeply interested in people. I love taking pictures of people, portraits, street, you name it. That's actually like one of the things I think I, I do the best. So I decided it would be really, really interesting to see how it works if I take this aspect of what I usually do out, because a part of this work is also reinventing myself as a photographer, so I wanted to go into a very different direction. And that's a really good reason for me not to um, like include people, but really just look at the places I have lived, right? Because the people in there, they would also, like, it's not about the people, like, it's very personal, so the, the people wouldn't add meaning necessarily in this case. Thank you, that's a good question. I think it's a, re it's a, it's a re yeah, it's a, it's a really good question, because it's one of the hardest things to do in Saigon is take a photograph of any aspect of the city that doesn't have people in it. And, it. and yeah, you know, ethics and all of that is a real problem. But it's also, it is about the spaces themselves. When you have images of people in, you tend to focus on the people and you start to interpret the people. You, 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 what are they like? You, you know, that kind of thing. You know, what's their life been? And, and all those sort of questions come into it. Whereas if you're actually just looking at the, the physical built space or natural space, without people in it, you focus on, you focus on the, the kind of the remnants of people's presence. I think it was, uh, when I was doing my PhD, there was an architect who talked about um, a typical architect kind of approach, but it, it, this idea of, of, of the, he called it the violence of when people move into a, a built environment, into a, into a space, into a piece of architecture. He calls it a really violent act because it changes 
that space totally. Uh, I think question for Andrew and Becky, because it's unfair to ask Chris. Right? Uh, so for the kinh tế project, do you the next project do you think you will do the kinh du lộc? Because <laughs> the kinh du lộc is stretched even more uh, communities, where I think it's very different to the kinh tế one. You know, very modern, where you see people exercising with dogs. It's a very kind of very contrast to the community that was was a gangster-ish uh, community in the district. For <laughs> it's true, right? Yeah. Is that part of your? I mean, do you think about that, or, or you just would like to stay in the middle of D four and D seven? I think that depends on our funding. <laughs> like, um, now, at the moment, it's currently focused on D four and D seven, but that doesn't mean that it won't expand to other areas. This is just, as I uh, said before, just the starting point of this journey. And you know, like each time we talk about this project between us or with our wider kind of research group, and even with the alumni artists, sometimes. Well, each time we find out something new, so this story is continuing. Um, hopefully, this will be one amongst a series of these captured stories and interpretations. But who knows? Yeah, I, I, it's it's kind of a, a a good question. I mean, the fact that that canal canal has actually been re regenerated, and um, and and it's an interesting example because it's a regeneration as people focused rather than monetary value focused, which is, unfortunately, when you look at a lot of the regeneration in the city, it's, it's property developers just wanting to make as much money as they can in, in, a, um, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the quickest and easiest possible way. I think the, for us, the focus is, is um, and, and, and around that canal as well, is, is the same, but is this, we kind of feel that they're kind of working with just these ordinary art, what we're calling unexceptional spaces in the city. Um, th by working with them, it increases a value to them, but it's a value that's a kind of a cultural value. And that we feel is kind of, it is important because I've sat in a number of conferences here in universities in, in the city and there's, very highly educated people that just have quite an appalling attitude towards those kind of spaces. They just see them as being of no value whatsoever and that they'd just be demolished and we give it over to Finn Homes or Novaland or whatever, the big developers, and they just build these big developments. So for us, it's about kind of in trying to increase a value in, in areas that a cultural value and a cult, through an understanding of those areas, areas that are not celebrated in any way. They're kind of the, they have a, they have a huge monetary value because they're on ri a riverfront or a canal front, which means that every developer's eyeing them up thinking, if I could build a tower block there, I could make X amount of money with river views and all of that. Um, but it's, it's trying to build that cultural value. So we're really looking at those spaces that are not. And I don't know whether I should really say it, but I, the pointy end of District 4, there's, there's actually a lot of political problems with people who don't want to leave um, because they're being pushed out by developers. Uh, so can I ask more questions because I'm very curious. So what is, uh, what, um, what is your criteria when you pick the, like, which city and which canal in your project in the River City Network? Because like, um, yeah, if, if, it's, uh, if it's not based on the monetary values, but I think that like, whenever like, we add the cultural values into like, some project that like, they have the physical space, so it's automatically or like gradually over, ta over time, it will increase the price in real estate and then like other, um, other like economic, uh, uh, economic value as well. And um, yeah, because I, uh, I read a lot of books uh, from Vương, Vương Hồng Sen. 
and uh, he's a very f famous author writing in about the history of Saigon and the not only Kinh Tè but also like Kinh Thị, uh, Thị Nghe Keno and then like uh, the Saigon River that divides the Thu Thiem city, uh, I mean Thu Thiem area and then like now with the district one. So if like how, what kind of like, yeah, the criteria that like you want to pick the, your next project? Yeah, when, when we were looking when we, we were looking into joining this River City network, we kind of looked at several areas. I mean, the obvious, the first one was to just look at the Saigon River, and we, but we just thought it's kind of, it's too big. We needed something that we could really focus on. Um, we did look at some of the other tributaries and canals that lead into that river, but we thought this was kind of an interesting one because District 4 is in an, in an interesting uh, position in terms that the, the 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 economic value of land there is just through the roof. There's nothing you can do about that. That's always going to happen. There's always going to be speculation and that, that kind of. Um, but it's also probably one of the areas of the city that has maintained a kind of a very strong identity of itself. Um, and 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 that was kind of very important and. But we also kind of, I'm, I'm kind of quite interested in, you know, the, this top half of District 7, which has again a, a strong identity. And then the bottom half of District 7, which kind of has obviously has an identity, but it's an identity that is, is probably more international and, and it, doesn't, it doesn't feel, you, you, in, in many aspects you could be anywhere. You know, it doesn't feel that you're in Ho Chi Minh City. The reason, the main reason we, we focused on Ho Chi Minh City is that the team that applied for this network were based in uh, RMIT via uh, Saigon, not in Hanoi. Um, so yeah, that was kind of our main reason. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I just like to pick up on uh, what you main, mentioned about the part of District 7 that could be anywhere, uh, which is quite interesting. It, it relates actually to the, the work I did before this one. So um, there was an online exhibition I did with the Goethe Institute, and I called it City, and I was looking at these specific generic places that are really like a, a true global city in a way. Like it can be anywhere, like a, a Starbucks, um, like a... I don't know, McDonald's, fast food restaurants, like um, malls, like these places that are absolutely interchangeable. And uh, what I did in that project was like exploring these, but then trying to, to put hints in it where you maybe could still find out where it belongs to or not. So, so um, I think that's also a really interesting type of place, but of course it would be a totally exactly. different project. But I, I find these places very fascinating as well. Yeah, exactly. I, I mean, there's a, there's a great book by Marc Auger on super modernity, and it talks about these these kind of um, spaces where you kind of go to be somewhere else. Yeah. You go there to leave. Um, and, and a lot of spaces in District 7. And it is interesting because of that, yeah. yeah. Uh, is this, uh, okay. <laughs> oh, so thank you so much for such uh, amazing presentations of your projects and I just have one question is for Andy and Becky. So in terms of like, I know this is too soon to ask, but like um, in terms of like scaling up your projects, because I can see that your projects is quite like promising, like it's really promising because I can really relate it to your uh, experiences in Hems and um, in the streets and District 4 and District 7 as well. So in terms of scaling up, like do you have already have like a visions of how would you like convey the project itself, like in terms of sounds or smell, like layers of sounds and visuals as well? I'm just out of curiosity. So in terms of scaling up, I mean, um, back to our design process as well, we're going to reflect on what we've done. And already I, after speaking with Andy and with some of the alumni, I already know how I'm going to add that to the way that I produce my uh, particular hemispheres. Um, also, the next point for us is, okay, we've got like this, we've part of this amazing exhibition for VFCD, which is awesome already being amongst all of these creative practitioners. 
However, having the physical exhibition here for us is still not next to the canal. So for us, we very much want people to visit both D4 and D7. Uh, we've already planned to have some smaller community events that we're collaborating with um, Saigon Creative Club and other like community platforms in the city where we will now bring the people to the places to experience our AR. So it's not a grand upscale, but it's little improvements like that or kind of carrying on that storytelling for us. You're kind of uh, ignoring the, 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 the elephant in the room, which is that as part of our funding, our funding is, 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 is a small, we got a small grant from RMIT to help get the project up and running. And um, part of that agreement is that we have to go and apply for an international grant for big money, <laughs> um, which is really hard and difficult and nobody wants to do it. Um, but that's kind of the next stage. So hopefully, We'll have to apply whether we get anything or not. But we're getting a lot of interest from RMIT Melbourne who want to collaborate as well. And I can see, talking with Christian, there could be collaboration that we can, we can work. Um, and we've got a colleague, Thierry, who works with sound. And I'm, I've already got an idea for a project that we, can, we could develop this project on from looking specifically at sound as well as visual. Thank you so much. I just wondered if you considered, um, uh, I don't want to distract from your uh, subject of the history uh, of not, you know, not gentrifying or trying to create different uh, new upgrades and spaces because of money, but um, with uh, the environmental issues here in Saigon, with Saigon sinking, I'm wondering if you've considered that element in 10 years, 15 years, what will those spaces look like? How might that influence your art or your, or your predictions of how things might change? Actually, funny you should say that because one of our students who is also the graphic designer one uh, for our AR zine, that was her project when she was studying with us. And actually we work with um, students a lot and in our own work to speculate on futures. So again, taking that data and almost plotting it on a timeline and looking at the different parts that are moving and what may be changing. So although we can't predict what's going to happen, we can use that and then also like the lenses of the environmental changes and the climate to speculate. Mm -hmm. That could be an interesting visual, like an overlay of what might not be there anymore. Yeah, I think that's kind of one of the, I think where all three of our work is kind of quite important is that it, it, it ends up, it, it becomes a documentary archive of the places within the city which without being too scaremongering, but might not exist in 50 to 100 years' time when it, at the rate we're kind of getting rid of, you know, kind of warming up the planet. Um, they could well be underwater. Um, um, yeah. Uh, I, um, because, like, you were mentioned about, like, the visual, and then, like, I'm thinking about, the, like, the contemporary art right now, and I have a question for Chris. And... Uh, as you know, like the glitch aesthetics that like you mentioned, actually like used to have been uh, it has been used like a long time ago. Since like the big Nam Jun, they had uh, he always has artwork using the old magnet put on uh, the ma big magnet put on the old TVs uh, for the hit video uh, sculpture to create that kind of distortion. And also like in um, an another works by Jamie Fenton. Uh, uh, she and her dinner uh, works as well. She also used the same technique, and um, we can uh, uh, we can recall like there are a lot of movies that like uh, for example like Matrix, when uh, we often have the like the glitch to show that like, it's the error of the machine. So what um, I mean like what the error mean in the third space? I mean as you mentioned in uh, in your in your uh, photography works. Uh, means to you, and then are you going to use also the same thing in the future for another works as well? Uh, thank you. Uh, very good question. And I, I think that that really also leads us back to the idea to, to compare the idea of the glitch itself, like like Namjoon Park, like, uh, which is a real glitch using a magnet to like distort the TV and so on, right? Which reveals the machine, as I said. Um, and then we have the glitch aesthetic, which is 
almost could be seen like as an Instagram filter, or it could be a little bit more complicated, like the one I did. But um, I, I find there's an interesting comparison between the words glitch and kitsch, because glitch becomes to used so much now in aesthetics, as you said, in modern movies and so on. And so for me in this project, like that's an aspect of that nostalgia of looking um, at home, uh, like what is home, like the, the memory, like looking through tinted glasses and so on. So, so that's the idea why I use this aesthetic for this project. Um, for my next project, I don't intend to use that. Like in, in, in the next step, actually, I'd, um, like also for my research, I want to explore Saigon in a different way because this first part was very personal, right? And my idea for the next step is uh, to uh, collaborate actually with the space and the people because I haven't done this in this first part. Like it is about Saigon, but so far I haven't collaborated with the city except for looking at my own memories. So what I plan to do in the next step is I want to, again, work with uh, ChatGPT, and um, I want to work with numerology. So I think I'm going to start with uh, lottery tickets, uh, which are like a big part of like Saigonese culture. And I'm thinking of like um, creating um, a piece of software that could turn the number on a lottery ticket into a random coordinate in the city. And that's where I want to start my photographic journey and see where that takes me. Yeah. Uh, OK, thank you very much. So. Uh yeah, if you're your own... Uh, okay, so one last question, <laughs> and then like... <laughs> yes. Hi, hi, Andy and Becky. I took your class last semester. <laughs> so um, I, I was really curious. So uh, Becky, you, was talk, um, you were talking about your, your, you were a mix of Chinese, Vietnamese, and British, and you were talking about generational heritage, and then Andy was talking about how um, the speculation of no, not like the, the research into the sites um, may trigger some memories of you when you were young. So I was curious when you were doing this project, did it help you understand yourself more, or was there in any way it, it like reinforced your identity? Um, for me, uh, yes, of course, it's a short answer. So actually, I'm really kind of observing again. I'm really looking, listening, and using all of my senses to kind of really feel a space. I've started to understand a lot about my family's past. Um, they all migrated to England in 1979, and I only have one aunt left here in District 6. So even through this project and through kind of like living really locally as well and being in the hems and seeing that community, I've learned so much about like my mum's past without her even telling me. You know, things may be a bit difficult for her to talk about sometimes. However, through these small discoveries to understand, like I said before, capturing that sense of that atmosphere, already like I feel that I can talk to and talk and communicate with her better. So on a personal, like, um, in a personal lens and perspective, I do feel that projects like this and our research um, have really helped me. And actually, I have to thank Andy for um, inviting me to the project because I'm actually an early years kind of researcher, early career researcher. <laughs> yeah, I, I, um, I don't know. My daughter tells me I'm, I'm weird and... and... So I, I tend not to want to think about myself very much. I don't, I don't go into that space. I don't, I'm not interested in my own identity. I, I'm just who I am. I just, there, I'm there, and that's it. But my experience of being in the spaces is, is fundamental to everything that I make. So... Um, the, the experience of being in a built environment, in a, in, a, in a physical space, wherever it is, you know, even in, in, in this space, my experience of that is something that I use to um, generate my work, and it's something I'm really interested in. I, I come from a f family of architects, so I have a, a, a kind of almost DNA of interest in space which is probably why I'm focused more on the built environment and natural environments and less on the people that occupy and live and work. And as much as those people are very important, I mean, you know, the, the only reason I do the work that I do in this project is 
is because of a deep-seated kind of sense of wanting to be well-being towards the people that... Because there are people that don't... A lot of people that don't have many choices in life. I've, I've been lucky. I've had... I'm here. I've had lots of choices. But those people don't necessarily have those choices. So my, I don't want to focus on them, but I'm kind of... The work is very much for them. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Sorry, yeah. can I just add uh, one last okay. thing that came to mind and you just made me think of it. When you were asking me that question uh, or asked the question, my memory is now in context. So obviously, I, I through that generational heritage in England growing up, I'm like, but why? <laughs> why doesn't that make sense? Why is this here? Why are you using that? You know, and now that I'm here, I'm like, ah, okay, I understand. So it's bridged those gaps in that memory and that narrative too. Thank you. Uh, yeah, okay, so uh, thank you for participating in this practice talk. And uh, yeah, I think uh, this is all for today. So I hope that like, you guys, um, all of you can uh, participate in other events uh, from uh, Vietnam Festival of Creativity and Design uh, by joining us with uh, another event on the, our social media, vfcd.events, and also our website. And um, yes, thank you for coming today. Thank you very much.